Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Retail Solutions Coach, Natalie Tan. Natalie provides clients with tools to excel in their business. Over 25 years in specialty retailing has provided Natalie with the expertise to offer innovative strategies to help you maximize your revenues. Without further delay, let's begin. Natalie? Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for joining today. I'd like to mention that today's seminar is crucial to all retail businesses, especially the small but independent businesses. Why? Because, first of all, in 2011, $6.6 .6 billion were spent online by Canadians. And by 2016, that number tripled to $19.2 billion. And next year, it will be almost six times the number of that in 2011. It will be $39 billion spent by Canadians online. And this is according to Forrester.com. And today's session on how to delight our customers, how to surprise and engage them in cru is crucial in ensuring the survival of any small businesses. So first of all, let me tell you about this photo. I normally don't include myself in photos, especially not as seminars. But I'd like to share with you what happened on this day. Normally, when I go to London to shop, I don't shop for toys. I don't have any kids. So most of the time, it's for skincare or clothing. Oh, you know what I'm talking about, ladies. At any rate, my husband was with me walking, and suddenly I lost him. And I'm going, where is he? And I look back, and he's stuck right by the storefront of this store. And he was watching some magic tricks. And then so I walk back, and the next thing you know, we are so engaged. We walk inside the store, and inside the store, it is so difficult not to have fun. Uh, in one floor, there are about 12 stations where they get you to actually play. And as you can see, I'm playing with one of those helicopter, I don't know, I think they call it heli balls. And you kind of go around the store chasing after the ball and it doesn't want to land on your hand. So it's that type of fun. This store is a toy store called Hamley's. They've been in business for, I don't know, probably since the late 1800s. Um, and they're the biggest store, uh, toy store in London. Now, if you contrast that to Toys R Us, where they are closing all the stores in the United States and the ones in Canada are being bought over, you take a look at why has Hamley survived all this time. And that is because without any... Um, intention on my part to be uh, inside that store. I was delighted. I was surprised. I was definitely engaged. And in the end, I go home thinking, God, what the heck was I thinking paying $60 for this toy? But the whole point was that during that time, you are so engaged into the product that they're asking you to try. Right? So let's start the session. First of all, Retail is experiential. And what I mean by that is I would like you all to think, how can you engage your customers inside your selling space so that you are delivering an experience? You're not just a place where there are products displayed, where people come in and buy. You're a place where uh, they are engaged and they're involved with the product. And that way, you can interest them with so many different things inside your store. I mean, in retail, we have a rule. You kind of need to sell three things to each customer before you can let them out your store. And the best way to do this is to ensure that as a customer walks inside your store, everything inside your store delivers a great experience. So how can we do this? Well, think about this. We have five senses. So we have a sense of sight, right? We have the sense of hearing. We have smelling, touch, and then taste. So the photos shown here, first of all, this lady touching that hand right away, her sense of sight, her sense of touch is engaged. This store on the right-hand side with all the candies and that chuck wagon is from a store called... Um, Horse Creek 
Heritage Candy and Gifts. This is right on the main street of a small town called Cochrane, Alberta, and they're about 30, 40 minutes from Calgary. And what I love about this store is the fact that as soon as you walk in, they can give you uh, tastes of the candies that you're interested in. So it's easy for them to actually engage the sense of taste and visually with all the colors. I mean, can you just imagine all the kids coming in delighted with all the candy that surrounds them, right? So uh, Horse Creek um, candies are is one of those places which is like a wonderland for all kids. Now, in that sense, retail then remains very relevant. And what I mean by this is how can you ensure that the products and services that you offer remain relevant with your customers? And one of the things that we're looking at and how to create relevance is first defining who you are. Is there confidence in your business and products when customers view you? Um, do you have a strong brand DNA? And this means, uh, does your customer know what your business stands for? Have you built your brand equity inside your selling space in your shop exterior? How does your shop exterior convey who you are? And in essence, what we're trying to say is, if there's maybe another business or two in the same area where you are, what sets your business apart from everyone else? In essence, what is your sustainable competitive advantage? And the key word here is sustainable. It's not something that's just um, an advantage now, but it's a sustainable advantage that lasts a long time, right? So in essence, we'd like to establish what we call, what is your story? How did you come to be in business? Uh, what is the angle? Why should customers shop from you? Um, why did you start the business in the first place? Is it a passion about your business? Or is it a passion about meeting all people? Or is it a passion about buying everything local and supporting your local suppliers? So all this is your story. That makes up your brand DNA. Now, why should I buy from you? Right? So some of the reasons people will buy from you is because people that work in your store have an expertise on the products that you sell, something that they may not get if they, get, if they go to shop at a big box store, um, maybe expert opinion. I know that online right now you can get reviews and opinions on products and therefore customers get a more educated or informed decision when they buy a specific product. In your case, you could actually have this delivered verbally by your sales associate, right? So why buy from you? That could be one competitive advantage. The other competitive advantage is you have a wide selection of products that people could instantly purchase from you, take it home without having to wait for it being delivered when they buy online. How do you resonate with your customers? Um, are you targeting the right customers uh, with the color scheme that you use inside your store, the product selection that you carry? Does it resonate with them or has it um, or have your customers outgrown it? Right? So these are some of the things that are key because if they have outgrown the products that you sell, then it no longer resonates with them and you can no longer deliver what we call experiential retail. Now, customers nowadays will always buy with a purpose, right? And one of the things that I mentioned is when you give them a reason to buy, make sure that reason is something that is valid for them, not just for you, but for everyone in your community. For example, if somebody's buying jewelry, right, they usually have a purpose for it. But Displaying jewelry by itself is a hard sell. And that's why, for example, if you take a look at the history of diamonds, we all think diamonds are rare, and that's why you pay the price that you pay for diamonds. But in essence, I don't think there's a shortage in diamonds. I just think that De Beers, who holds, I don't know, 90% of the world's diamonds, just created a wonderful story around it. 
that diamonds are crucial for engagement rings, that diamonds equals love. And that's what I mean by consumers buy with a purpose. They don't just buy a product for itself, but rather what the product can do for them. For example, gifting jewelry to a friend, to a family member equals love. And therefore, when you display your products, you need to display it in such a way that it conveys this message of love. And that way you can make that whole shopping experience engaging to the customer and resonating with them. One of the key things, how do you enhance your customers' lives? As mentioned, people don't buy the product for the product itself, but rather what it can do for them. And one of the stories I usually tell is, you're probably familiar with the store um, where they sell teddy bears that you can customize for the child that you're buying it for. So when my niece was five years old, she walked past that door and right away her eyes lit up and we go in and I go oh this is affordable the bears or basically the shells of those teddy bears or any plush toy that you see in there is about probably twenty dollars some are even on sale for ten so I go oh, okay this is affordable I'll bring my niece in and the next thing you know she, she, she chooses an item and they have to stuff it they go to the stuffit area and they stuff it with all the stuffing inside and gives it to her to hug to ask if it's the right amount of stuffing if she wants it softer she or she wants it firmer and before they sew the stuffed toy up they they actually ask you if you'd like to put anything inside that bear say for example a heart which costs a dollar or if you'd like to put something inside that when pressed would have either a sound or saying a phrase right like I love you and again that's another few dollars in there and you get the they get the child to rub the heart and that way the bear comes to life and then you rinse off the fluff and then you're not done you go to the section where they sell clothing and of course they sell clothing by the set and you're not done you have to buy the bear accessories like a handbag or a hat or shoes or uh, necklaces and cell phones and then only then you can go to the station where you print out the bear's birth certificate and then they put in a box where the bear peeks out of the window that looks like a house and of course you know at the end I spent over a hundred dollars and I'm going oh my lord however what did I get out of it my niece saying, oh, auntie, I love you. Now, that is priceless. And so in essence, regardless of the price, it's what the customer gets out of buying the product. And I get that I love you, which costs way more. It's priceless than the $100 that I spent for that bear. So how do you enhance your customers' lives? And one of the things that I use to convey this is, signage right something that I can print out of my own home printer so if you take a look at this example this alive health right away people know what the product is being sold so for example we don't say weight loss we say healthy weight right and instead of detox we say body cleanse and as you notice the ones on the shelves are framed they're eight and a half by eleven which is exactly the size of your printer. So tell customers what they get out of buying from you, what your product does for them to enhance their lives. Now, other things that is important to our cons consumers right now is sustainability. How are your products in your store, or maybe your store itself, contributes to environmental causes? So these two stores that you see here are stores that we recently designed and built in Victoria, BC. The one on the left-hand side uses um, products that are recycled. For example, the wood at the back, the wall, is made of reclaimed wood and we whitewashed them. On the right-hand side, it's the same idea. It's reclaimed barn wood where literally uh, the contractor found this old barn in a field in uh, Vancouver Island and uh, tore that um, 
barn down and use the wood here. And the wood that we use for shelves are what we call live edge. So in essence, these are shelves that still have the bark in them. And one of the suppliers for this door actually uses wood that's only been, um, it's not fresh cut wood, uh, but rather wood that's uh, rolled down the hill from avalanches. So those are some things that customers might be interested uh, to know when they come to your store. And again, signage plays a role into how you convey that to your customers. Now, other customer values is whenever there's special causes. For example, Denim Day was just probably a week ago. And this store in Whitehorse, Yukon is Seasons Fashion. And they support um, Denim Day. And so for $5 a button, uh, customers get to support families affected by cancer. Now, other things that's important right now is what we call customization. And when it's customized, it's just targeted for them and it's personalized for them. I was um, walking around Vegas over the holiday season and suddenly I came upon a store at Caesars Forum. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but right behind Caesars Palace, the hotel, is a huge shopping center called Caesars Forum. And in there are high-end stores. And one of the stores that I found is Dolce & Gabbana. However, this is so different from any Dolce & Gabbana stores that you see because everything in the store that they were selling was white. All the runners, the power wall of running shoes they have at the back is all white. The clothes are all white. The t-shirts are all white. And I'm going, what the heck is going on? And I go in and actually there's two stations. One station uh, has a painter, an artist working on that table. And basically what you do is you buy this white pair of sneakers that you like and you can tell the artist what you'd like to uh, to uh, have on your sneakers your name you can have a city you can have drawings uh, you can have landscape drawings of your favorite uh, city uh, on on the shoe so that is customization on the other side of the store you can pick out your t-shirts or your jackets and there are patches and pins that you could choose from and right away if you choose a certain patch that you'd like, not just a patch, and by the way, a patch is $30, you can choose up to 10 patches or more uh, and have it sewn into your jacket right there and then. And pins, right now, this is a hot commodity. People are buying tons of pins and pinning it on their hats, on their clothing, on their sneakers, and everywhere they could attach it just to personalize the product and make it unique where they are the only ones that have that look. So that's an example of customization. So think about your store. What product do you carry that you can customize? And that way customers will have something unique that's only on their own. Now, engaging your customers. Now, a while ago I mentioned one of the key sustainable advantages you can have is having an associate or a team of associates who are experts about the product that you sell. They might have purchased it before, used it, and therefore have an opinion about it. Or if you don't have that, all you have to do is go to the internet and check out um, customer reviews and somehow maybe include that in your in-store selling sign. And that way when people see a product, right away they know this is a highly rated product, right? So engage your customers through verbal communications. And this is fairly easy because don't you already say hi to everybody that walks inside your store? And then once they pick up an item, that's when you can approach them. And the best approach to use normally is what we call a product knowledge approach. So telling people what the product is all about. And in essence, telling them the fab, F A. B, features, advantage, and benefits of the product, right? Now, let's talk about, I have mentioned the five senses. And one of the key uh, factors in there is a sense of sight. That makes up 80% of the entire senses. The remaining 20% are your supporting sensitivities. So let's engage our customers. So first of all, uh, this is a totally different session, uh, but there's a, uh, ones where we talk about how can we influence how people walk inside a store. 
So setting a right traffic path to ensure the full selling space is penetrated, uh, the ease of navigation and the ease to access all areas in the shop is key, right? But in essence, we need to first influence the eyes in order to get the feet to follow where the eyes go. So in essence, what is the first story that you're showing customers? Uh, this is a store in CN Tower, a gift shop, and right off the bat, as soon as you um, leave the elevators coming from the tower, uh, you are greeted by this Canadian story. And as you can see, people are engaged. People right away are touching the product and interacting with it, reading the labels and so on. Right? The other thing that we use to engage our customers, and it's very powerful, and I'd like to take some time to cover this in this session, is colors. Now, take a look at the before photo of this store on the right-hand side. As you can see, they kind of just put some items in there to show customers what they will find inside a store. The problem is because there are so many items and people normally can only buy one idea at a time. Most people will just walk past this window. Now, in order to address this, because this store carries little tiny stuff, right? And as you can see in the after photo, the pictures, uh, the picture shows like small items that they carry, like stationery and gifts, uh, household goods, for example, like the chair cushions, waste baskets, and so on. Now, in order to have a more impact, just choose one story. And in this case, because it's the month of April we chose the story of cherry blossoms. And this is uh, uh, the time in Vancouver where all the cherry blossom trees actually come into bloom. And that's why we chose the color pink. And right away, it's eye-catching. And it's funny to watch the number of people that actually stop and look at the window. They actually sold out of, uh, for example, the Hello Kitty um, stuff toy or the little piglets that's coming out of the basket on the fourth shelf on that pink solid basket, right? So um, these are small items and I wasn't expecting customers to actually look through each small item, but they actually did. And that's actually good news for sales of the store. Now, now let's talk about primary focal points and secondary focal points. When I said a while ago, we need to influence where the eye moves, focal points play a um, vital role in getting the eyes to go from one point to the next. So the first primary point or primary focal are your shop windows. These are in the exterior of your store and hopefully before your customers walk into your store they already have a good idea of the price points that you carry, product selection, and your target market. So for example in this case this is a holiday window for seasons fashion and we chose the color pink to um, create a pop of the black and whites that most Canadians wear. Um, and so bringing that onto the tree that they have, all I did was uh, uh, used inexpensive florals, probably you can buy from the dollar store or your uh, craft store and just add it in to continue the color. And as you can see, the background poster has a diagonal line of pink leading your eye down onto the tree. Right. Now, another type of primary focal is what we call an editorial space or a feature display inside your store. In this store, as soon as you walk in, you are greeted by this primary focal point. Now, I mentioned how powerful colors can be. If you take a look at this photo, take a look at that red color, where does that lead your eye to? So you go from the front where that tablecloth is, and then it leads your eye all the way to the back wall, doesn't it? And guess what happens to customers that see this? Wherever the eyes go, the feet follow. And therefore, I would like customers, the intention for this is to get customers to shop the back wall, not just the front section of the store. And in this case, they walk from the front all the way to the back. That is usually the goal of any primary focal display. Now, in terms of displays, this is a totally whole uh, different session, uh, but I'd like to show you some techniques that are actually quite effective when you do any display, whether it's a window display, a primary or secondary focal point. 
Now, this is a favorite window of mine that I took last holiday season from a shop called Tiffany, and we all know what Tiffany sell. Now, what I love about this, first of all, the contrasting items in there um, actually grab your eye. Take a look at that black background, and then this white stars, and then you can't ever take your eye off from the blue. The Tiffany blue is very dominant in here. And why? That's because that's what they're selling. That's their brand. What does that Tiffany blue mean? It means love. It means luxury. Uh, whoever you're getting a gift to that is in a Tiffany box, right away you know it's something special. In terms of contrast, take a look at that metal um, mannequin or that small man pushing that cart. It, metal without touching it by visual we know right away it's cold and yet you contrast that to that warm fuzzy um, toque that that mannequin is wearing or that body form is wearing so you've got something smooth you've got something fuzzy you've got something cold and you've got something warm and then not only that if you take a look at the snow uh, it's gritty compared to the smoothness of the metal in terms of direction, well, the cart is tilted diagonally. Triangles and diagonals are great because they add movement to any display, and right away it attracts the eye better than, say, for example, a horizontal line. Right? Also, I like the fact that they have a play on proportions. We all know that Tiffany boxes are small, and yet in this window display, the man pushing that card, right, feels like something heavy and something big that things could just fall off. And of course, you can see the ring on the floor. You can see the pendant that's dangling. You can see the watch. And those are the very things that they're selling. And that's, that's some of the reason why I love this window because of the difference in textures that engages customer senses. So if I go back to this primary focal display, right away I have the hardness of the floor in contrast to the softness of the fabric. I've got that smooth fabric in contrast with the spiky flowers behind it. I've got the appetizer plates that are cold and hard again in contrast to the softness of the fabric. Uh, you've got the smoothness of the floor versus the wrought iron that has spikes in it. So without knowing, I mean customers will not go to your display and say oh yeah there's a lot of contrast, uh, contrasting textures in here but for some reason they're not aware of it and they don't know why they're drawn to certain displays and that's the reason why because it's so interesting and it engages the senses. Now for example one of the key things that's important in any, any display is first of all that it should grab attention. So this is in White Horse in the holiday season where it's minus 45 degrees and we've got this hot poster of a half-naked man right in their front window. So it's so hard not to grab uh, attention with this poster and then you want to entice customers or shoppers to touch the actual product so uh, they can go inside a store and instead of these items being all in boxes there's actually samples that customers can touch and then you build an emotional connection by the way I forgot to mention this is a ladies fashion store but they're just trying to um, uh, see if there's a market for men's uh, clothing in here and that is because majority of men's clothing are actually bought by women and therefore in essence we'd like to appeal the women to buy this for their men so in essence how do we build an emotional connection right away by that poster right most customers can see how their men can maybe look sexy in the sacks underwear even if their man is the least sexiest man around right and then, of course, most important for any display is that it gets customers to buy. You can have a beautiful window. and You can spend thousands of dollars on your window. But if it doesn't sell the very product you're trying to sell, then I don't think it's a successful window. As you can see here, we did not spend much for the window. We actually paid for the poster and reused some old pencil Christmas trees and just used some leftover 
ribbons that we have, right? It needn't be lush. Just make sure it fits within your budget and it conveys the message that you need to to your customers. Now, some of the display elements that I mentioned, apart from proportion and contrast, is shape. So if you take a look at this circular shape, right? Right away, circles sort of enclose a product. And it doesn't give the eye any choice but to focus on the very product that you're trying to sell. And that's the power of having a circular shape enclose or enrobe the product that you're getting customers to buy. Secondly, if you have shelves underneath that circular enclosure, you better have something that will stop the eye from going round and round and round in this enclosure, but bring it down. So in this case, we use dollar store flowers. And if you take a look at the pussy willow branches, it actually goes down onto the next shelf, bringing your eye down and so on. Now, I always tell my customers this, when all else fails and you can't group products that in the way that they make sense, just group it by color. So the primary focal point that you saw earlier with that appetizer plates and the red fabric that drew your eye all the way back, well, when they sold them down and there's a few left, this is what they did. They just grouped all the same colors like the warm tones, the browns, the yellows, and the oranges together. And this is what you call formal balance. If you're not sure how to do a display, just take a look at this. Triangles are key, so the top table is a triangle. If you can do the second nesting table as a triangle, great. And when you fold that display, if you take a photo of it, fold it, and you open it, it mirrors each other side. So that's what I call formal display. So the staff in this store, while they may not be well-trained in visual merchandising, I thought they did such an excellent job in creating this wonderful display with the leftover appetizer plates. Right? So when all else fails, group by color. Now, being Canadians, we shop by the season. And therefore, if you take a look at the photo on the right, again, this is a spring window. If you're not sure, just group things by color. Now, let's talk about color tones quickly. Now, if you are not well-versed in colors, which a lot of people are, that's fine. All you need to know is group things by color and by color tone. In this case, if you take a look at the color of rainbow, red, orange, yellows, that tone is warm. Just think about the sun. The sun is warm, and therefore all the colors that are uh, close to yellow, like oranges and red, are warm tones. On the other hand, you have the cool tones, which is the greens, the blues, and the purples. So grouping those together and not um, mixing them together will create a better solid display. You can also do colors uh, with, within that same color family, do from light to dark, and keep it that one color story. That also works. Now, if you want to jar the senses and uh, create something exciting, go get a color chart or just download one from the internet and choose colors that are opposite to each other. So in this Crown Royale um, display, we did a contrasting color, which is purple, which is opposite your yellow, right? So right away, that uh, jars the senses and it creates a more exciting display. Now, this is, uh, it depends on your taste. I, for one, um, at an age group where I want everything nice and serene and flowing, uh, less contrasting, less drying. I don't mind contrasting textures, uh, but sometimes some uh, contrasting colors can be jarring, which, by the way, is really great for a younger demographic. Other things that we also talk about is proportion uh, and direction. And in this case, if you take a look at the color, is the color white heavier or is it lighter? Well, it depends. If you're taking colors from light to dark, white is really light. However, in contrast to something that's clear, like the glasses uh, in the shelf display, white is actually heavy. So we use this white to direct the eye. And you can see the arrows in here where it leads your eye from the top to bottom. And that way, the eye does not miss any part of this shelf display in the cabinet. We talked about textures earlier. And here's another great example. Now, these are $35 folding um, tables. And the funny part is, regardless of the price, they weren't really going as fast as the retailer would like to. 
So what I did was I did a display and went to HomeSense and bought some items to create different textures. So right away, you know that the table is smooth in contrast to the spikiness of the plants that we put in or the floral display. We have the coldness of that bowl in contrast to the warmth of the fabric. Again, the smoothness, the hardness of that bowl in contrast to the softness and flowing fabric that we put underneath it, right? So, so many different textures in here actually sold the very product that they were trying to sell before when there was nothing on top of it. Now, repetition is one of those uh, that really engages the eye, and that is why I'm not so keen on fixtures like the slat wall, you know, with the uh, horizontal lines that are repeated throughout, and that is because repetition gets the eye to follow where that repeated pattern is. In this case, it's great because I'm trying to sell the jeans and therefore the repeated patterns of jeans are actually where I get the eye to stop. But if you have, for example, a slat wall and unless you're a dollar store, everything is covered, the eye tends to go to the repeated patterns of lines. And unfortunately, the wall is not what you're trying to sell. It's the product. And so when there's a slat wall, it's harder for the eye to to concentrate on the product when all these repeated patterns of line are trying to get the eye to look at it. So, so far we've talked about the sense of sight, right? Now, sense of touch, by the way, is the textures that we talked about earlier. And people don't necessarily have to touch to know the texture. But one of the things that is key in the sense of touch is, by the way, not only the hands Customers also have their feet that touch your selling space. And so, for example, if you have a hard flooring surface, people tend to walk faster on it. The moment you have a carpeted area, they will step off it and now they will walk slower. If you have different price points inside your store, you can have hard flooring. And then in the area where you have high price points or a table display of high price points, you can put an area rug in there. And right away, that sense of touch, which is their feet, know that this is an area that has or that they already expect to have a higher price point. And we know this. When we go shopping, the more our heels sink onto the carpeting, we know that the prices are way higher, right? So you can do that same effect inside your store without that thick, lush carpet. You just put an area rug in there. The sense of smell. Now, um, unless you're a food store, right, where you can, uh, for example, if you're a cookie store, you can pipe in or you don't have to pipe in, you right away just smell cookies. Or in a movie theater, we right away associate it with the scent or the smell of popcorns. In this display for maple, I mean, we can't help it. It already smells of maple. But what if you're a fashion store or what if you're a home accessory stores? What type of scents do you put in? Well, we actually use scents, not throughout the entire store, because that could be pretty overwhelming. But we use it in areas where what we call challenged areas or dead areas. Um, and the most uh, accepted scents are vanilla, uh, and citrusy scents and lavender. These are pretty common and people will normally not complain about it. Uh, citrus smells wake people up and if you have a vibrant store that might be the scent that you'd like to put in, right? So um, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money. I, I have to make a confession. I just go to Walmart and, and buy a Glade plug-in and when you buy a citrus scent it's kind of um, it's acceptable for everyone, right? Some people might call on it being synthetic. So if you have a store that even sells candles, that might do the job for you. So you might want to create that section where the scent uh, emanates from a challenged area. And you will notice that people actually will gravitate towards that section. Sense of hearing. What should people hear inside your store? Well, apparently there's uh, a layering of three sounds that is the most successful as Steady's find. So we all have music and the faster the music, the higher the turnover. So depending on the type of product you sell, for example, a fast food joint will have fast uh, tempo music because they want a high turnover. That means people come in, sit down, eat, leave so that the next batch of people can come in. Now depending on you, the age group that you're 
targeting, playing the music that they love will make them stay longer. And I remember when I was younger and Whitney Houston was huge and I played it inside a store. And it's funny because all the women stayed until the entire song finished before they left the store. And that increased the amount of time they spent inside the selling space. Studies show that um, customers actually spend 17% uh, longer inside a store where they like the music and therefore that translates to a high, a more or a longer selling period and therefore a higher probability of sales. Now the layering that I mentioned earlier is not just the sound of music but rather there's also people talking and I think that's more important because you notice that when you're out to buy say for example a microwave oven and, and a customer is already there talking to a sales associate you tend to listen in, don't you? So people talking about the product is also key. And the other one, of course, is the sound of business going on. It's not so much the ringing of the cash register, but great if you have a ringing cash register, but if not, just the sound that there's um, business and there's transactions happening or that there's people around the space. So those are the, the layering of three sounds that make it successful. And last is the, the sense of taste. I mean, I mean, if you have food, great. If not, now, what is tasteful and not tasteful is very subjective, right? So, for example, uh, items that fell on the floor, that is jarring and in, in, a, in a very negative way. So that could be said that's not tasteful at all. So a very organized store is what we mean by tasteful. Now, this is an example of the store where uh, they sell scrapbooks. Right? And a lot of people say, oh, I love your store. And that's because shopping is easy in here. Everything is organized. And depending on what you're buying for, for example, you're making a scrapbook on travel, you go to the travel section, all the stationery for travel is already there, and the albums for travel is already there. Before I let you go uh, today, I just want to quickly uh, show you some examples on how to make people fall in love. And the very reason that people buy products is because they love a product. This supersedes more than the need for a product. And therefore, making customers fall in love is key. So take a look at this photo, right? This is an example of uh, a shop that sells uh, dog cookies along with accessories. Um, and in this case, we just took a, a, a plush toy off a dog and put a dog dish that says takeout on it included some holiday cookies in it and then have some cookie canisters that are bone shaped and then of course topped it off with signage and again going back to color story we chose one color which is red now take a look at this display right it's already grouped the same product but is it romantic no why is it not romantic because it doesn't show product in use the best way to show products is how people might use them or how the end user might use them. So in this case, again, take one story at a time. In this case, I took the blue and created a story around it and put the plush dog toys around it and just draped a towel as if the puppies are playing with it, right? And right away, people pass by and they go, oh. And in fact, in this window, they actually sold the plush toys and they have to kept on re uh, keep on replenishing this. But it's a wonderful problem to have when people buy the products that's in the window. Okay. And then this one here is actually a dog's clothes closet and it's quite expensive. So if it doesn't show in use, if it's just a clothes closet, most people won't even know what it is. But when we display it this way with the end user and the accessories and clothing inside with the dog nail, nail polish and shoes inside, right away they know what it's used for. And this is one way to actually engage and excite the customers that's inside the store or in the hallway before they walk inside the store. Okay. So that ends our session today. I hope you've enjoyed them. If you have any questions about how to resonate with your uh, customers or even how to do a display correctly or if you have pictures of your store where you're not sure if your display is right, you're more than welcome to send them to me. My email is info at natalietan.com. Again, thank you for joining me this afternoon. 
thank you, Natalie, for a great presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended today.